Welcome to the latest episode of The Claws Corner. Today's guests include members of the high-energy, hard-rock, national recording artists hailing from New Munster, Wisconsin, The Almas. Songs such as Crowns, Burnout, Cage, Reflection, and Lifeline are destined to become classics. In 2022 alone, the band covered over 39,000 miles across the United States, just shy of 100 shows. Their hard work and dedication has definitely paid off. In 2023, the Almas took home Rock Band of the Year from the Josie Music Awards at the Grand Old Opry. So it's my pleasure to welcome founding member and lead guitarist Frank Slifka and lead vocalist Crystal Teglin at the Claws Corner. Frank, Crystal, how the hell are you? Thanks for being on the show. What are you doing? Great. We are great. Thank right. you for having us on here, man. Well, this is going to be a fun time. As I mentioned off the air, uh, your publicist reached out to me, and I've been doing a lot of research, finding out about the band. I'm so glad she did. You guys are great, and you're probably one of the hardest working bands I've ever met. <laughs> well, thank you. That means so much. <laughs> so let's get right to the beginning. Uh, what I'm so impressed about is, Frank, I'll start with you, because mm -hmm. what year did the band start? It really wasn't that long ago. Uh, it was 2016 yeah. it started. That's yep, really and uh, yeah, we started heavily touring in 2019. How did you so, go from, I mean, so many bands are playing the clubs, playing these, like, trying to get shows, and three years you guys are playing all over the place. How Just hard work, dedication, and saying, you know what, we're going to do it no matter what. Yep. Yep, and a little insanity, I think. Yeah, and we have a <laughs> do-it-yourself. <laughs> yeah. We definitely have a do-it-yourself kind of attitude. We're yes. not going to wait for someone to come along to uh, make us break or help us book. We're just going to do it ourselves. Yep. And... Really uh, no, sorry, I didn't interrupt, interrupt you, but I love the attitude, and I'm not sure if you like punk music, but did you ever hear of Henry Rollins? No. No? Okay. Well, he's, a, he's a punk we'll singer. We'll have to but, check it out. Yeah, he's yeah. in a band, or he was years ago. Now he's a, he does acting, he writes books. Now he does spoken word. He goes, travels all over the world and talks about it. But the reason I bring him up, you got to check this out. He has a book that he wrote about his experiences in Black Flag in the 80s called Get in the Van. It's okay. basically what you guys are doing, and I love it. Oh. That's awesome. Yeah. Get in the van. Get, Get in the, the van. van. Yep. And right. That's Henry Rollins, you said? Yeah, R O L L I N S. Okay. I get that. Right. Get in the van. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's what I got to do. Book by Henry Rollins. All right, yep. All yeah, right there so we he go. He won a got Grammy it. for that. And you know, it's um, from what I read too, is that you got, I think uh, you were saying, yeah, Frank, that you put over 200,000 miles on the van one year. Uh, yeah, we, yep. Yeah, since we've owned it, we've, we've gone over 200,000 now. Wow. From just touring, and we got that in nineteen, didn't we? Yeah, May of twenty nineteen. Nineteen, and then of course, two, we don't count twenty twenty because of COVID. <laughs> yeah. And twenty one was slow, so you know, more or less in three years, we put that kind of mileage on. That's three four years. Impressive. So, did, so you, both of you mentioned that uh, do it yourself type of band. So, are you the ones going out there, making the connections, going to the club, saying, you know what, I would love to play in your town, book us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, whenever we go into a town, we make sure that we keep note of the manager, the you know staff and crew, um, whoever's the point of contact for booking. Uh, yeah. But otherwise, I we both split booking and management ourselves. She's the workhorse on it. <laughs> I do most of the booking, but uh, but yeah, we definitely split the load here. Mm -hmm. All right, Crystal, this next question's for you because I love this story. Tell me how a vampire named Victoria Bathory. Got you introduced to Frank and into the music scene. So uh, I used to be a vampire named Victoria on a local TV show. And it was very like Sven Gulli, mystery science theater, Elvira type of uh, TV show. And we would show old B-rated movies. Well, uh, the host decided to start branching out into the music scene of the, the local area. So we were like, well, let's bring on local punk bands, rock bands, metal bands, and introduce them to our audience and see what sticks and just kind of show more for uh, promotion for the bands in the area. And one of Frank's uh, former bands yep. came up on the show. And so that's how we have initially met. Yep. And at the time I was like, oh, these guys are really cool. I'd like to go see them live. So I ended up bringing my mom to the show with me. And <laughs> all of a sudden she's offering to manage the band. Oh my and, God. 
and yeah. or well not manage the band initially but she was just like why don't you practice at my house because he was talking about losing his practice yep. space and yeah. he was like well I, we just met you know i'm like i don't know if dad would like that but but um, it did happen it, it ended up happening and you know we became friends and uh, a few years later in 2017 this was in 2014 that we met mm -hmm. Uh, so 2017, a year into the band, their original vocalist was leaving as I was starting my, you know, in the my first band that I was in, yeah. I ended up leaving at the same time that the original vocalist of the Almas was leaving. And so it kind of just like perfect timing. He, mm -hmm. hit, he hit me up. He was like, hey, you want to come try out? I, you've got some chops. Let's go. Mm -hmm. So the planet. And I don't know if I like... actually made it. I think I just I stuck around. Did. I think you did. <laughs> just didn't leave. <laughs> I, I have to say, obviously, the acorn in your family does not fall far from the tree. Your mother meets the band. Yeah, come on, I'll manage you. You're over there booking the band all over the world. So it's just like now I see where you get it from. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> So before the, you joined the band in what year? Was it 20? What, 17, the end of 2017. Yeah. And before that, did you, were you, because oh, you mentioned that you were on the TV show, you were playing the vampire. Were you in bands before? Were you a vocalist in, uh, in past bands? I was a closet singer. Ah. Um, I would sing in the shower. And uh, my dad's favorite phrase to me was, uh, who sings that song? And I would name the vocalist. He was like, yeah, keep it that way. So I, would, <laughs> I, I was like, oh, yeah, I don't belong on stage, but I really liked music. So with the, you know, being the vampire on the TV show, I ended up branching off doing my own thing for a while and just kind of promoting bands and setting up shows and bringing bands together. And uh, a friend of mine actually signed me up behind my back to join or to try out for a, the band that I ended up being in. Yeah. And so he kind of just dropped me off in the driveway of this dude's house and was like, I'll be back after the after the interview and drove away and <laughs> just ditched me at this random person's house that I really didn't know. And so I tried out and ended up making it in that initial band, but I was only there for six months. I really wasn't happy with the certain dynamic that was going on in the band. And mm -hmm. I've never been in a band prior to that. So wow. I really didn't know what to expect anyway, but. So that that was never your thing growing up. Like I want to be a singer. I want to be in a band. I, I definitely right wanted to. Oh, you wanted to. <laughs> I just didn't think it was a possibility. Uh. I, my parents would have like ABC, uh, Good Morning America on TV. And one time there was like Britney Spears appeared. And I saw Britney Spears. I told my mom, I want to be a rock star when I grow up. And then that shortly turned into I'm going to be a teacher because that's more practical. But uh, <laughs> then I ended up being a rock star when I grew up anyway. <laughs> Well, I love the fact that you have very eclectic tastes, and Frank, you as well, because I've listened to, I've, we're going to talk about some of your influences, but you go from Britney Spears to ACDC, Taylor Swift, Debbie Harry. So it's just, I mean, that's like me. I, like people, when I'm in the car and they're like, I'll go from Mozart to Slayer to ABBA to Barry Manilow to uh, Metallica, and they're like, what the hell are you listening to? I just love music. There's some. There's something great in everything. That's what I love about you. So Frank, for you, how did you mm. get your start playing music? When you were a kid, did you always want to be a guitar hero? Oh, no, man. Uh, I, I, my dad would always play like 50s and 60s rock and roll. So I, I, I grew up on, yeah, I grew up on that, the doo-wop stuff. Yeah. And it wasn't until I was downloading music off of LimeWire back in the day. Yep. And I caught myself jamming out to ACDC's Back in Black in my basement. And <laughs> like, I just, I wanted that feeling all the time. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to create that feeling. So that's why I picked up the guitar. And uh, that's kind of what started off. And I was 13 when that happened. And I'm 33 now. <laughs> so that that's what did it, man. I, yeah. And I, I seek that feeling all the time. Oh, no. I, I, I Years ago, when in my 20s, I was in metal bands. And I know that feeling of just getting up there. And when, especially when the audience is into it, that feeling, it just, you, there's nothing that can replace it. You're just a yeah. high that is so hard to come down from because you're so worked up. The audience is into it. You're into yep. it. Yeah, I, I put that guitar on and that first chord, the first big chord through the Marshall. I'm like, I'm there. Oh, yeah. I'm good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So we know Crystal's influences. Who are, besides that, you mentioned ACDC, Back in Black. All right, let me quote, ask you this. Before we can get into your other influences, Bon Scott or Brian Johnson? Who do you like? Oh, I I used to be Brian Johnson all the time. Yep. And as I get older, I really start to appreciate Bon Scott. Yeah. 
So we'll leave it at that. I no. like both eras. No, well, that's, <laughs> you know what? You and I are on the same page because I always say there's, I mean, besides, I mean, I'm sure there's more, but Van Halen with Sammy Hagar and Brian Johnson, ACDC, there's not really too many bands that can completely get a new singer and reinvent themselves and be even more sure. popular than they were with the original singer. So that's, I enjoy both of them. So, yes. uh, yeah. So uh, besides ACDC, then who else would you, because I know we, you mentioned doo-wop in the 50s and 60s, mm -hmm. which is great. Uh, my my biggest influence is really when it comes to guitar, because from like the 80s, yeah. a lot of, I like the 80s hair metal. Um, but specifically, I like C.C. DeVille from Poison. Mm -hmm. His uh, his solos are just really fun. And I like that kind of stuff. Um, and then uh, Mike Ness from Social Distortion. Mm-hmm. His songwriting, um, the simplicity in the music, too. So I really jive off of that. So that's been one of my... Oh, and Chuck Berry, naturally. Yes. Yes. Sure. yes. Uh, but yeah, mainly that that kind of this bluesy storytelling kind of rock stuff. Really what I yeah. I gravitate towards, get influenced by. So. All right. so I mentioned when you first started, when you got together with the original band in, uh, in 2016, where you're as i mentioned in the intro you're from wisconsin did you just start playing local clubs and how did that how did you build it up i know we talk about the diy do it yourself and just become bigger, bigger did it did you take off immediately or did you have a did you come out with a demo and start passing it around for the underground like how did you get uh, as big as you were as popular as you yeah, are you know i it, it did start that way it was very go 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 because when i had left my other band um, there was a lot of mixed emotions as to my leaving and uh, this you know truth be told the local scene kind of turned against me when I left the other band I, I, I left because I, I was I'm, I was an alcoholic and I drank a lot and I want to kind of refine myself and, and start a new project so the almost which means soul in Spanish but you know because there was a lot of negativity about my leaving and misunderstanding it really pushed me to want to get out of my local scene i wanted to leave so bad because there was nothing here mm -hmm. so it was just like it was um you know hit the road and and like we pushed out an album our first ep i pushed it out in oh god only a couple months wow. it was out the demo and a year after the band started we were signed to a small label uh here in wisconsin and then it, it was like even when crystal joined it was only three months after she joined we released another album so everything always moved very very fast it was always go, go, go. And uh, yeah, that, that was just always how it's been. And <laughs> so it was just like, release music, go play as much as you can, hit up all the, the local areas. Let's see if we can tour. Let's try that. Okay, awesome. Let's do that for a month. Let's do it for two months. And we just kept, we just keep doing that over. <laughs> yeah. Well, I want to get into that with the touring, but before we sure. do that, because uh, it's a good segue, you, you were talking about how fast you recorded with Crystal. So Crystal, Tell my viewers how many songs you had ready when you went to the studio. <laughs> we went into the studio for the original album or yeah. for this current one. I think I'm all right. Maybe you can. Re, um, I'm not really sure which one it was. Where it's like I, you went to the studio for one time. You had no songs ready. I think you had three songs, and then you changed everything at the last minute and said, "Okay, so you basically started from scratch." Was that the newer album? I, that's wanna... the new ep okay. so we, wow. we had five songs that the band all jammed out and we were really excited to bring into this new studio experience mm -hmm. and our produce we sent it in advance to our producer kyle odell and i'm not kidding you when we showed up we were like all right well uh let's uh let's talk about these songs he was like I only liked this one. We're going to scrap the rest. And he was like, this one's got potential and let's work on it. Let's record it. Uh, and so we're like, oh, okay. So, and that song even got changed completely mm -hmm. the last day in the studio. Cause it, at, we, you know, we wrote lifeline was the first one we wrote together with Kyle. Uh, and then we, you know, went through the rest of them. We had to go right back the, to the original song life jacket. Yeah. And I, I looked at Kyle, I was like, it doesn't mesh well with the rest. It doesn't jive. It was like, we, we got to zhuzh it. Yes, he was saying. <laughs> Is that the technical say. term? Yeah, we got to zhuzh. We got to zhuzh this song. <laughs> and he looked at me, he's like, are you being serious right now? It's... I think it was one, it's two one, in the morning. Yeah, one or two in the morning. One or two it. in the morning. I just got done with all the melodies for all five songs. And I told him, I was like, 
I think it needs to be judged. He was like, all right, everybody be quiet. Get me a coffee and a, a monster. Yep. And so let go. me, let me, let's look at like, what we can do. And so. And drums <laughs> were being recorded that morning. Yeah, that so morning. He, so he <laughs> smashed his song out. He just restructured it. He kept, the only thing yeah. he kept was the. My vocals, my melodies, and Frank's guitar solo. Everything but, else about that song was deep sixed. Wow. And yeah. Yeah, it was it was mm -hmm. very crazy, but that was the kind of energy that was in the studio the whole time was if, you know, just because you like something doesn't mean that, you know, if you change it, an audience member is going to miss it because they never heard it in the first place. Mm -hmm. exactly. So don't be so attached to what you're writing yeah. right now, because if we can make it better, we will. But also don't don't fixate on something for too long because that's just going to waste yeah. time and burn you out faster. Kyle is a mastermind. That guy. Yeah. Yeah. He, He's a he deserves the world. <laughs> that man is awesome. Yep. Well, it's funny because I've written a book too and I used to be part of a writing club. And the reason I'm bringing that up was that um, there was a, I did, went to a writing class and there was a teacher who said like, perfection is the death of good. You can keep doing it over and over and over again. You're never going to get it exactly you want. Just get it as good as you can and move on. So I love the fact, like, first of all, you're right. Nobody even knows what they're missing because they never heard it. You know, but if you get fixated in one thing, you try to make that thing perfect, you're going to just never get that one song done. You're never going to get the EP out, the album out. So mm -hmm. just get it done. And it's funny because I saw a documentary in the Bee Gees. And I, didn't, I mean, I don't know if they did this all the time, but one time they said they went to the studio, they had no lyrics, and Barry Gibb would just start singing. He had no lyrics, and they started doing jive talking. I think he wrote it right in the spot. So people like you wow. and that, it's just so impressive that I love that creative side where you're like, no, we, we could do it. It's like you never, you don't get brain freeze. I'm like, oh, my God, I have to think of this. What am I going to do? It just, it just flows right out of you. It's nerve-wracking. Like it, really it, all, it shakes you up a yeah, bit. Yeah, you're not because we, we never wrote like that before, and all of a sudden we're forced to do it, and it's like, oh my god! Yeah. <laughs> like earlier, you mentioned uh, our song "Reflection." Prior to this new EP, um, full of singles that we've been releasing, "Reflection" was the last song that we put out that we recorded, and that song took us upwards of two months plus just yeah, to right. get the lyrics figured out yeah perfect and everything else and we were so stuck in our heads because we wanted to convey a certain message we wanted it to feel a certain way yeah. and we wanted you know so much to be put into this song it took us so long to accomplish so taking two months and then going into <laughs> the, our newest studio uh session with two weeks whether we come out with half a song three songs or nothing then oh, that's no. what it is so mm -hmm. we're you know the fact that we came out with the five songs that we did and we're so proud of them yeah. and just the the work that it was and putting ourselves into a whole new element and you know seeing what we could do it was yeah. definitely whiplash but in the best way yeah. oh well i i've listened to it several times and i love every song there's not every time i think this is my favorite song i listen to the next song no this is my favorite song no wait a minute so yeah it's, <laughs> I, I love it and it just i i just can't get enough of it so a question for you is because you know i'm thinking of people like rick rubin and obviously george martin with the beatles they played a big role with different bands especially with george martin and beatles getting their sound do you have a producer that you work with on a regular basis that helps you find your sound or is it mostly the band says nope this is what we like we're going to do it ourselves that used to be our way up until meeting Kyle. Okay. Yeah, he's, a, he's the fifth member. He's the one that said, you know, we're going to spend our time here in the studio finding who the Almas are. Yeah. Are you cool with that? And I'm like, yep. Yeah. And so he he was able to hone in on exactly what uh, what we need to sound like. And he he's, he's a wizard. Yep. Yeah. And honestly, that's why he scrapped all of the songs that we wrote, except for one that we ended yeah. up changing you know changing completely anyway yeah. but that's that's why he was like i don't hear who you are in the songs that you brought me yep. and what you've released in the past i really don't hear you and i want to discover who you are if you're yeah. gonna let me like frank said yeah. and so that so that's why we didn't record what we came in that we wrote as a band you know all you know putting our own little spin on stuff yeah. he was like no let's just see what we can do in the moment and you know what i can help you guys discover of yeah. yourselves well i love that because there's there's no ego with you guys saying oh no this is our song we know what we want to sound like so the fact that you trust him so much to say all right let's do it your way 
Where did you find Kyle? Through uh, through friends of ours, we went uh, on tour with the Light Divided mm -hmm. um, years ago, and they were the ones that hooked us up uh, yeah, with introduced Kyle. Us. Introduced us. We were going to go to another producer, and uh, I'm, I'm happy we didn't. So yeah, we, we it tried was bad vibes all around. Alan. Yeah, but but. <laughs> Yeah, we got a chance to meet or talk with Kyle, and um, it, it just it just worked out. But it was thanks to our friends in the Light Divided. What other bands does he work with, or has he worked with in the past? Um, oh God! So Plush's song uh, "Left Behind" uh, mm -hmm. that they put yeah. out, um, he was part of the team to put help put that one together. But, uh, uh, he's worked with um, well, Citizen Soul. Soldier, soldier, uh, motionless and white. Yeah, uh, Nita Strauss. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. The Nita Strauss is a newly released album that she did was Kyle O'Dell. Yeah, um, God, he works with so many people. Um, wow, yeah, he's, he's got a good track record. Yeah, he's, no, he's, he's got a lot. There's so many yeah, to, yeah, to name, but <laughs> yeah, definitely the the bigger people up there. God, yeah. I can't, I'm blanking he, he right now. He works with a lot of other producers as well to collab with bands. So yeah. he he's friends with a lot of the people that even yeah. write like three uh, three days grace, I believe, is one of them. Like yeah, the he works hand in hand with them, and yeah, like he's he's with, he's very well connected. So how yeah. how in the hell we got hooked up with him? I'm we're I just very know. thankful. <laughs> yeah. Well, your fans are very thankful as well because it sounds great. I love the collaboration between the band <laughs> and him and Kyle. I know we mentioned different ways of like, you know, you went to the studio last time, basically didn't spot another time. It took several months. So for normal, I guess what would be considered normal, what's your writing process? Like Crystal, do you write the lyrics? But I mentioned, I heard you mention you have the melody too. So is it, does Frank, do you come up with the or the music first and then Crystal writes the lyrics or does it a collaboration between the two of you and the it, band? It, can, it, it just depends. Like uh, Kyle would lay down like a set of chords. And then Crystal would come up with a melody, you know, for it. And maybe she would come up with some lyrics. And then Kyle would look at me and be like, Frank, we need a riff. Yeah. So I would come up with a little ditty or something. And he'd be, then he would go ahead and change it a bit. And that would be a song. But there were other times where we had a whole chorus. The whole song was kind of put together, but there wasn't really any lyrics on it. Yeah. And so that one, like, we were really frustrated. So like Burnout, I had a heavier hand in writing the lyrics on that one. Yeah. But there's songs like Lifeline where Crystal headed all the lyrics on it, like absolutely everything. And I'll, I'll, you know, and I had a little bit of the riff and that was way after, I think, yeah. the lyrics were written. So it, it all just it kind yeah. of depends per song. There's no real set way yeah. at yeah. this point. Sometimes, know? like he said, he would just put some like chords down from like a keyboard synth kind of thing or find something cool to vibe with. And we would, we would just go with that. Mm -hmm. And just build off of those four chords or whatever. And do you only write when you're um, when when you're inspired, or do you just say, okay, well, we're gonna just try and write a couple songs today, or is it just like, all right, well, you know, let's, uh, I have this I have this melody, you want to see if we can write some lyrics with it? How does that work out? Yeah, well, uh, we haven't written since the studio yeah. um, together, yeah. so we're going back into the studio the beginning of August this year. So we're we're basically just going with a clean slate. I do have some like melody and some lyric ideas that I'm gonna bring in, but really we're just kind of gonna go in and just exist in the moment. Yeah, you know, I got some subject matter, some ideas and concepts about where we want to take it musically, but besides that. Nah, we'll worry about it when we get there. <laughs> <laughs> I love that attitude. Eh, it'll we'll make it work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there's there's so many bands too that sometimes they feel trapped at like, oh, we can't try anything different because the fans are going to like that. They expect this from us. Do you feel that kind of pressure? I would say no. Mm -hmm. um, Cage was our first released song mm -hmm. from the new EP, and it we did that because it was so different yeah. to everything else we've released especially with reflection being the last song we release and then releasing cage the first song to ever have like true like full production bass drops all the yeah. wub wubs and all of the things with it and so we were just like okay if our fan base is not going to like our new direction this is going to be a really good telltale sign yeah. but i think our existing fan base really took to it and the other people that listen to it kind of turned and be like, 
wow, I really like this band. They've got some cool yeah. things happening. Yeah, and like the tone of our music, I guess the tones of the guitar and the keys we wrote, it really didn't change. Uh, it just maybe stylistically we changed yeah. things. So it wasn't too drastic of a change, but it's just whether people are going to like the style change. Yeah, and that I was think, that was yeah. one thing Kyle patted us on the back for. He was like, at least you guys already were were in her vocal range. With, yeah. With, with the keys you chose and everything yeah. else. Yeah, so. so yeah. <laughs> Well, that's why sometimes I think the record companies don't give the fans the credit they deserve. Because I think the f most fans are open-minded enough, to, like, you know what? Fans have to expand. They got to grow a little bit. And the more they play, the more they want to experiment. And record sometimes record companies, if you have a big hit right off the bat, they're like, oh, no, you got to keep it the way it is. You don't want to, you don't want to mess up the formula. So I yeah. like the fact that, because are, are you currently signed as we're speaking? Yes, we are to a an independent art uh, label out of Florida called Wake Up Music Rocks. We work with Pepper Gomez, and she is an absolute pleasure yes. to work with. Yeah, she lets us keep hold of our own creativity, and it's it's been nothing but an incredible time working yeah, with it's, her. Yeah, it's been good. You know, she she lets the artists be the artists. Yeah, and then uh, she truly believes in us and the bands she works with, and that's more than we could ask for. Was she a former musician? Maybe. Is that the reason? I believe she is a musician. She's a vocalist herself. She releases she? some music. Yeah. Oh, wow. On her yeah. Wake Up Music. So she has two different um, labels. So it's Wake Up Music and then under Wake Up Music is Wake Up Music Rocks, yeah. which is for like more of the metal bands, yeah. the rock bands. But Wake Up Music is for like pop, EDM and that kind of stuff. So she'll do collabs with other artists uh, on that side of the label. Yeah, the reason I asked that is because I did an interview with somebody who wrote a book on the Carpenters and Herb Albert is the one that signed them. And they nobody wanted them in the beginning. Herb Albert was a musician. He goes, just give them a little time. Let them be who they what they are. They'll they'll find their way. And you know what happened with them. <laughs> They're really a really big band. So that's what made me think that she's a former musician who understood what you the band's going through and what it takes. So I, I love that. I'm going to mention some names and I love this list. Some of the bands that you played with saliva Whalen, shallow side dizzy reed from guns and roses tantric max weinberg janet gardner from vixen and jakey lee that's an mm. impressive mm. list i'm sure there's plenty more those are just the names that i found and heard through my research mm. so was uh are these all bands that you opened up for throughout the years yep yeah starting from the early years uh wayland wow. was before my time mm. um that was actually one of the First couple months, the band was together. Yeah. Um, Frank and the original lineup yeah. performed with Wayland. Yeah. Uh, my first show was with Dizzy Reed. My first show ever with this band. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, Jakey e. Lee was out on our first tour when we were in California at the Whiskey A Go Go. Yeah, we opened up cool. for him there. It was a really cool experience. Yeah. Well, good. Let's um, stop. Wait, stop right there for a second because I love <laughs> Jakey e. Lee. I love Shot in the Dark. And everybody always says, Whatever happened to Jakey Lee? He disappeared. What happened to Jakey Lee? So you actually- He's got the him. Red Dragon Cartel. He's doing it. He's yeah. still doing it. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, I he... actually have a funny story because I'm not good with putting like names and faces together. So I had an actual conversation with him at the Whiskey A Go Go and I never knew it was him. <laughs> uh, so Frank, uh, Frank plays, uh, his preferred guitar is Hagstrom from Sweden. And so they look like Les Paul style guitars and he just really likes, I'll let him talk more about them, but right. uh, basically he <laughs> noticed the Hagstroms off and I was helping Frank set them up. And so he came over and was talking to me about the Hagstroms. He was like, you play Hagstroms? It's like, oh no, I'm just the singer. But you know, he was like, it's really hard to be unique nowadays. And mm -hmm. he was like, your guitarist is very unique and he should be proud of that. And I'm like, and, and so, Lisa. <laughs> yeah, so Frank came over to finish up like putting his straps on and tune. And I told him, I was like, yeah, some guy came over and was saying, <laughs> complimenting your guitar. <laughs> Come to find out it was Jakey e. Lee. He's up on stage. I look at Frank and I was like, that's the guy. I'm like, Jakey e. Lee. Like, that's yeah. funny. <laughs> yeah. But so, no idea. I had no clue. I was just talking to him like he was just some random guy at the bar. Well, you know, I I, I mean, in all fairness, probably if I, if I walked into a bar now and saw him, I haven't seen him since the, I mean, I've seen him on video, obviously, but since the 80s with Ozzy, I probably wouldn't recognize him in the beginning either. So I completely mm -hmm. understand why, but that is like great compliment from a, 
awesome guitar player. So I, I love that. Absolutely. That's, so congratulations on that. And what, so what, what does he have? Is, uh, does he have a band that he's touring with? Or is this? Yep. Is this he does it, it's Jakey Lee and the Red Dragon Cartel. Oh, you did? Red Dragon yes, I didn't realize that was the name of the band. All right. Well, speaking of touring, let's talk about the Almas, because as mentioned, you played all over in 2022. Now, 2023, um, were you more of a headliner or were you more of a still opening for some bigger bands or more well known bands? We were, we were more of a headliner. All right. um, there was like a, a couple of festivals that we played that we, you know, obviously opened up for um, yeah. the bigger bands. But yeah, all of our touring that year was definitely more so headliner. Yep. And I think wow, we put in a hundred and how many shows in 23? And... That's a good question. It, it, was, under, it was just <laughs> shy of 120. Yeah, I think it was like 120. I don't know. But it, it, it was, was just over it's up there. It was it. Shows. Yeah, yeah, it was up, it was there, up there. And then we put in 45,000 miles in 23. All right. Well, we'll so, yeah. C24. So, you got to update oh, it to 2024 now. No, well, man. I'm excited to see what we do. I, I don't know how we're going to count the mileage over the ocean. Uh, but we'll yeah. figure it out. <laughs> we'll figure that out. <laughs> I'm glad that was a perfect segue for what I want to talk about because <laughs> you play overseas, you played in mm -hmm. the UK. What is the biggest difference between the fans in America versus the UK? We actually have not gone to the UK yet. Yes. Oh, okay. It's coming up this July. Yes. Maybe, okay, so that's what I was we reading. will let you know when we get back. Yeah. But we are really excited. We've we've heard a lot of great feedback so far yep. um, from just booking the tour um we're working with another company through wake up music rocks or yeah. label pepper um to handle that overseas yeah. tour because that's a little bit too too big of a bite for me to take yeah. on uh, right now so um, yeah. we're we're having them handle all of it we're really excited and but so far the reception yeah. from what we heard the band coming over is good you know yeah. they're doing some radio promotion and and things like that and so far it's being well received so I guess we'll see how it goes. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know what? That just means you have to come back on the show and talk about it. That's it. Yeah, Absolutely. I do. That, yes. Perfect. <laughs> no, I think that's what I was probably reading that you were playing here. And that's what I thought. So um, I can't say I know I have friends that played over there and they said the UK, that area, it seems like maybe because they don't get as much or they'd really appreciate music. It seems like, you know, sometimes and I'm not putting down all American fans. I'm just saying that sometimes they seem like complacent, like, oh, I can go anything. But they will go overseas like, oh, my God, they were everybody was there. It was a Tuesday night the place was sold out so i think you're gonna have a really good time from what people i know who are in bands that went over there so well we're just looking forward to the new yeah. adventure yeah, so right. we hope it would be great mm -hmm. <laughs> so i'm guessing this is a full-time gig for you for the the full bands it's no, none of you have day jobs anymore i i i had to quit my job because yeah. booking for the band takes up so much time as well as how much we're actually gone anyway yeah. um and i just took a Pretty much an almost an indefinite leave, uh, <laughs> like a couple of days ago. <laughs> wow! Congratulations. Uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I, I've been working. I, I'm an appliance repair technician, so I was doing that when I was home. But there's just so much to do now yeah. with the band, uh, just with everything. A new tour vehicle, this, that. So it's just I decided, you know what? I'm just not going to go to work anymore and let that be that. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever see the movie? Um, what's that movie when, when Michael Douglas where he just gets out of his car? I'm going home. I'm done. That's <laughs> like you. It's like, all right. <laughs> That's pretty I'm, much. Done. I'm, like, I'm, I'm done. done. I'm done. Yep. Falling down, it was called. The movie's called Falling Down, where he just gets okay. out of the car. It's like, all right, that's it. Uh, I will, well, congratulations to all of you on that. And then uh, I want to talk about the songs because we because uh, you have some great stories with the videos. But first, um, that song, Lifeline, I loved the, the song. And um, it had an earlier release date. But what happened with that? Why was it? Why did it take a little bit longer? Yeah, so we recorded it in July and we were hoping to release it in September for Suicide Awareness Month. Mm -hmm. But um, unfortunately, there was like a hiccup with the editing. Uh, apparently, the we found out that the hard drive got corrupted oh. uh, from our director and he, he managed to salvage the whole thing. Oh, good. But that kind of ended up taking up a, a bit of yeah. time. And then we, we just had a lot going on and we really wanted to give it a, a proper you know, release and promotion mm -hmm. and, and advanced promotion as well. And we were like, well, let's just take the time. Obviously, there's a reason that we're not able to put it out when we wanted to and we have to wait. Yeah. So we we're just like, all right, 
when it when we get it fully back, then we'll we'll yeah. put it out and and we we had a lot of special effects work that was yes. being done on it as well. So that took some time to to get that in the hands of of that artist, uh, Owen Spencer Spencer Olson. Spencer Olson. Mm -hmm. And uh, so yeah, so he took you know he 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 did the the video justice and did the great work and he he definitely got the whole project back on track too. So big shout out to him. Uh, yeah, no, it just just. Finances, we had to have the financing to properly release it as well. So yeah, it, it all worked out for the better. So yeah, definitely. It's worth the wait. Definitely worth yeah. the wait. Exactly. And, and knowing, knowing you guys, if the, if it, the files were corrupt, and you're just like, yeah, hey, let's just write a new song. No problem. Give give me three minutes. I'll get a new song for you. New <laughs> single. <laughs> well, I mentioned that you have, you know, the great songs, but along with those songs, you have some really great videos. So do you find it a fun experience or are you just happy to get it over with and why? So pre-shooting music videos, we're always really excited because yeah. Frank has a very fascinating mind <laughs> and uh, we give him full credit on the ideas for all three music or all yeah, three music videos that we have put out thus far for Cage Burnout and Lifeline all of which are very excessive music mm -hmm. videos. So then in the moment, we can't wait to get it over with. Yes. Because yeah. uh, Cage, we actually, we didn't use VFX. Like even like transitions weren't used for that one. It was all the flashing of lights that just let it meld perfectly together scene by scene. Yeah. Uh, but it was in the dead of winter in Minnesota. And, or no, it wasn't the dead of winter. It was the first snowfall of yes. Minnesota, yeah. I should say, because we recorded in October right. of 22 yep. for that one is when we recorded. And the water tank that we had, the holding tank, was warm water when we started. But since it was outside, it became freezing <laughs> cold. <laughs> and we had this rain system that it was being pumped into so we could actually perform while it was raining on us. Ugh. And that water was so cold. We were chilled to the bones. That was one yeah. of the very few shows the next day that we ended up having to cancel because we were just so beat up from a yeah. music video shoot. It was, it was a long, I think 18 hour day. Uh, I don't or, know. What no, that's excessive. Really excessive. It was like 13 15, hours. I think. 15 well, hours. We rounded out at 15. Just because, you know, there's a lot of prep work, uh, yeah. the lighting and stuff. And, uh, we're also very DIY even when it comes to our music video. So if it's something we can build, something we create, we're going to do it. Yeah. You know, we're going to try to make it as real as possible without using too many special effects or renting out crazy rooms to do something. Um, so that stuff, the creation and making all that happen, I, I get a kick out of, um, especially like life, um, Lifeline. Yeah. We had a helicopter where the whole cockpit was chopped off in the front because they actually used it for filming, but there was nothing in that helicopter. It was completely yeah. bare and empty. So we had to figure out a way to make our flight cases and all this stuff make fill up the helicopter to make it look like it was full of cargo and things like that um it, it was so yeah a lot of that creativeness i love about them but we're we're in a in a helicopter an enclosed helicopter now because we covered up both sides of this damn thing and it's in june july. and in july so the whole thing now becomes an oven and so you go from so one me, extreme to the other. Yeah. Yeah. The whole damn thing's an oven. And me. So while everyone's in the back, they're filming. Zay, my I call him my brother, been around the band forever. Him and I are jumping on one side of this helicopter <laughs> to make it move. <laughs> to kind of give a shaking effect. You have to get stuff to shake. You know, so you're in an oven, jumping up and down, <laughs> wearing a, a flight suit just to make this thing rock. It was it was ridiculous. But I, yeah. want to, I want to talk about that video because didn't you rent fighter jets, a helicopter? You rented everything. I love that. Yeah, yep, yep, we, yep. Yep, we went to a military museum and uh, well, we went to a military surplus store for a lot of like the patches and some of like the outfits. I think mm. um, was it the mask that we I can't remember no, what, I made what all parts, that. but I, we, bought we, had, we bought a lot of different like, you know, key element stuff yeah. off to make it look kind of more on that military aesthetic yeah. uh, to fit the military helicopter we were in. Um, but then we took all of that to this military 
uh, museum. And so this was the helicopter we used was actually a downed helicopter from Vietnam. Wow. And so there was bullet holes in it and mm -hmm. everything. And so that's, you know, why we were like, yeah. oh, well, this is going to be really yeah. cool to suit up. Yeah, we got a fighter jet. We were able to rent that. Um, and the, normally they, they don't let you sit in the cockpit. But the guy was nice enough. He's like, I can open up that cockpit for you. He was like, this and is the only one I can do it for. But yeah, I can so do he it. did. Do and it. they put in the, they they take out all the gauges because they, they can repurpose them. But he put a bunch of the gauges back. So it, they would be full consoles and put right. joysticks in. I mean, it was, it was rad. It was so cool. And I always want to be a pilot. So the fact that I could actually put the fighter helmet on and everything and then sit in there. Yeah, I was like a kid in a candy shop. Oh, he was so excited. It was so <laughs> awesome. Well, I can say my brother was a fighter pilot. Now he's an airline pilot. So he really, even he says, he goes, I wake up sometimes like, I can't believe I do this for a living. He loved it. And he said the one thing that's, he's, I don't care how many times you do it, the aircraft carrier, you'll never get used to. Because all they have is that one little hook. And if you miss that, I mean, he could tell you, he told me stories about friends having vertigo and ejecting and not making it. So it's just, yeah, it's crazy. But oh, oh yeah. But oh, you know, man. oh man, that's why for me, like I would love to be in the plane, but I would never want to fly it myself. I just like to be a passenger. <laughs> yeah. <I> right. <laughs> oh, that's, so I'm glad you got your Top Gun moment. <laughs> yep, he did. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we went from extreme cold. I want to say one thing about that cage video because you were talking about how cold it was. Now you couldn't make the show. You sort of had like a Princess Leia and Return of the Jedi um, vibe there going. So <laughs> I can't imagine how. If it was that, that was yeah, very good. That's that's a compliment. I was a, I was a big fan of that look in 1983 when I was a uh, nine years old. I'm still a fan of that look. <laughs> but the reason I bring that up is like uh, if you're telling me how cold it was, first snowfall, Minnesota, and you're dressed like that, I can only imagine. <laughs> Oh, yeah, fun it was. and I, I have to say it was worse for me than the guys because we did all of their wet, like single wet shots yeah. earlier in the day. So like during the afternoon when the water was still warm, by the time that it got to my single shots being wet, we did the full band together and then I had to continue doing myself mm -hmm. by myself. So it was so late at night. Everything was just freezing cold and the battery on the camera died oh. and so i'm wearing the chains in this reflection <laughs> pool and i have to just sit and lay in this water that's ice cold and luckily they shut the rain off so it didn't completely keep going on me while we were changing the camera battery and you know then he had to change the sd card and everything else i'm like can we can we like get me out of these chains and out of this pool please mm -hmm. oh man uh, fun times <laughs> so we well, went it was from, a great time went from the extreme cold the extreme heat now let's go back to the cold with burnout <laughs> ah yes sir <laughs> So that one it was always a story. Uh, <laughs> that was uh, what January? That was February. So February in Minnesota. in Minnesota. That one was the dead of winter. Well, before you let's stop right there for a second, because Frank, you get all the credit for the concept. Who gets the credit for picking the locations? <laughs> that was actually our uh, director, Austin Schersberg, that found that location. Um, Lifeline was one that we found, and then I believe Cage was a last minute find. Yeah, yeah, we I needed a, a place with a rain machine, so Austin found that one as well. Granted, Lifeline's second location that we shot, the airplane hangar, yeah. that was found the day before we made that shoot. Yeah. So we, we were at the military museum, and the behind the scenes uh, videographer, photographer, Chad, uh, from CAH, CAH Promotions was like, oh, you guys are looking for a hanger. I might know a guy wow. and literally stepped away, made a five minute phone call, came back. He was like, is tomorrow good? And he's and like, what like, time Absolutely. tomorrow? He's like, yeah, what time are you ready tomorrow? I'm like, so <laughs> seven if you want. You know? So that totally <laughs> all came together because of that moment, yeah. because of his one phone call and it all it all worked out. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. Well, so with burnout, let's talk about it. So filmed in February, you had an abandoned junkyard. It's three degrees with wind chill factor. And you talk, let's talk about the butane and flame shooter. <laughs> so the butane, it was so damn cold that the butane wasn't even lighting. It wasn't spraying. And so what happens, if you watch burnout, you'll see that, you'll see like specks falling down on the band, yes. like mist yeah. 
We'll yeah. have to on on um the butane that didn't light, and we're getting covered in butane. Yeah. Oh my god. Because it's not lighting. And so what they would do after we would do run the song once, they would take the butane canisters out of the flame shooters, they would put them into the car and put the floor heater on them to warm them up <laughs> enough that they would work, put them back in the flame shooters, and we'd run the song again. And then yeah, eventually it got so damn cold they wouldn't even work. So I think we did it in six or seven takes total. Done yep. because it was so cold. Probably the one video that wasn't so painful would be crowns because that was just a lyric video from what I saw. Yeah, yeah that was our favorite so far. Yeah, we we talked to Spencer Olson was like, hey, can you put something together? And he did. Yeah. And he showed us and we're like, that's nice. And the creative <laughs> aspect, the visuals, a hundred percent of what went into that was all his idea. We just gave him the song. We're like, well, we were gonna do a music video, but we really don't want to like the timing of it wasn't going to work out. So we are like, let's just do a lyric video and just go ahead and whatever you come up with is what it's going to be. Mm -hmm. And so everything about that song is visually just stunning. I am yeah. so impressed with what he came up with. And that was all by scratch from him. Yeah, the guy's good. Yeah. So good. <laughs> you, work, you work with some very talented people. <laughs> we we're fortunate. We yeah. were very fortunate yeah. to work with these people. Well, speaking of lyrics, I want to talk about the lyrics here. I mean, Cage, let's talk about that first, because that is about addiction from what I was reading. Yes. Um, so do you, uh, with that song, we'll talk about that song first. Was that um, written from somebody maybe you knew that was like, was it, or like, because they always say like, write what you know. Is So with that song, were you, the, Crystal, did you write the lyrics or was it Frank? I did. I wrote mo um, most most of the songs I write roughly in like the 95 percent range of lyrics. Uh, Burnout was the only one that I, I will admit Frank had the heaviest hand in writing, okay. mostly because we were all so literally burnt out. But uh, back on Cage, that one, um, you know, with Frank um, being uh, in his past struggling with alcohol addiction and having a lot of other friends that have, you know, been struggling with sobriety or drug abuse and this and that. There was actually a old uh, bandmate of uh, one of our guys that struggled with uh, addiction in a certain way. And so a lot of it was kind of inspired off of other people's, yeah. you know, addiction uh, kind of stories of what they've gone through. And so it was it was very heavily on what I've seen other people go through mm -hmm. uh, to write that song. Now, you mentioned burnout. What were you burned out about? It was just the whole grind of getting the Everything. band touring all the time, <laughs> driving all over the place. Yeah, it was yeah. before the studio it was a mad rush because we were right after the studio. We we're going right into a tour. So it was a mad rush to try to get everything ready for the tour. Blah, blah, blah. I remember we we rushed out of there to get down to the studio and it was like nonstop. And uh, by the time we were in the studio, we were kind of I wouldn't call it writer's block, but we you know, we it was a whole new writing experience. Tensions were high. There was a lot of um, stuff happening um, behind the scenes, behind the scenes that were, was really weighing down on us. And uh, it, it was just we were burnt out. Kyle hadn't had a day off in like six months. He was just wow. writing, writing, going, going, going. Same with us. You know, it would be like four Starbucks runs a day and energy drinks. So, I mean, everyone was running on nothing. Wow. And so that's where that song came out of. Yeah. Literally being just tired and saying, I am not going to give up. I'd rather die than burn out. I'd rather keep going and get this done, even if it kills me. <laughs> you know, even even yeah. if everybody turns their back on me, even if I'm going it alone, I'm still going to do I'm it. I'm going to do it. Yeah. Like they yeah. say, discipline beats motivation. <laughs> just yes, keep doing it. That's, that's it. <laughs> I love it. So, um, with these, so let's talk about Lifeline now. Uh, what I know the video, the fighter jets, the helicopter. What, what's that song about? Uh, that one is about reaching out for help, um, screaming for a lifeline, ah, okay. knowing that you know the battle that is within is sometimes the di most difficult one to go through. And you know, that one it wasn't necessarily meant to be on the military side, but just with the uh the lyrical elements of like the war inside my head and all of that it was it was just very leaning towards that you yeah. know we've ha all had uh family members or people that we care about that have served um and you know unfortunately i actually have uh, people in my life that have ended up taking their lives um 
they've came back from the war, but not the same. Yeah. And so it was a lot of personal emotion that went into that song, but it's very much so about, you know, knowing that sometimes you don't have to fight the battle by yourself. Yeah. I've heard some artists mention that they're, best creativity or they're most creative during the darker times. So do you find that maybe like um, some people say like when you're happy and you're complacent and you're, you know, you finally got to a point where you're just comfortable, you become more complacent and just the creativity isn't there. So do you, have you ever found that you get more creative during the times when things are going worse for you, like would burn out, like we're just so tired and you're just like, no. Nope. And then all of a sudden it just flows out of you. I mean, it just so happens, I think some of our favorite songs came out of some darker times. Yeah. Some of the songs that we've, you know, even continued playing the most um, in our live set came out of being like kind of at like a breaking point or we're so frustrated or we're so, you know, under pressure to get, you know, X, Y, Z done. Mm -hmm. And then we just kind of give up thinking about it and just do it. Yeah. And yeah. so I, th I think some of our best work does happen under extreme amounts of yeah. pressure. Yeah. Yeah. Like I sometimes I find when I'm down in a bad mood or something to write is actually very difficult for me because mm -hmm. I'm thinking about my my crappy mood or, you know, <laughs> yeah. and I, I don't necessarily want to write about it. Yeah. You know? I'm, I, I tend to write how I'm going to get myself out of it. Mm hmm. I like that. You know, that's so, yeah, that's how I write. So I don't like being in that spot. So I'll write a song to try to get myself out of it, I guess. Motivate ourselves. Yeah. Out of it. Yeah. No, I, I love it. So uh, let's I want to talk about rock creative. What is that? Yeah. Well, well, rock creative is a, a, a company that Chris and I have been talking about forever. Um, we started making merchandise cases uh, for the band, you know, with this, with TVs in them and, and lights. And we've always wanted to try to make it a, a company and actually create these things. So we founded the company to do it. And Rock Creative is a merchandise uh, entertainment and merchandising company. So because Chris and I do a lot of the ma management and booking ourselves, mm -hmm. we decided to create a company around that. Yeah, so that's so, what Rock Creative is. Yeah, something multifaceted. We can expand on it. We can keep growing. Mm -hmm. with, you know, we we fiddle with a lot of different aspects in our, you know, that we can get our hands on. So whether it's like, you know, DIYing our tour vehicle, uh, building, you know, all the electronics and everything yeah. for it. And now, you know, we're actually doing it again. Um, yep. But uh, yeah, between that, booking, uh, marketing, media, all of that stuff, we were like, well, let's just have, you know, an all encompassing company that, that can does it. just do it all. Mm -hmm. But so you're, you're do right now with the company, you're doing it for yourself, right? The with, For the Almas, are you going to be, uh, are other bands going to be included that you're going to help them out too? Oh, if people are interested right now, we're very busy with, mm -hmm. yeah. with some of our own stuff. But I mean, when it comes to like the merchandising uh, part of it, like building the display cases and yeah. stuff, we are for hire if anybody's looking for, you know, a display yeah. case. Well, even if it's not a band, yeah. you know, something that, yeah. you know, display whatever you're looking for. Yep. And you know, Crystal's done some website builds for a couple people. Um, you know, I've made a couple cases for people. Uh, so yeah, it, we are for hire, but it's mainly mainly the cases is what the what people can do yeah. or buy, I guess. Um, as far as our services, it just really depends on the time we have. Yeah, so, which doesn't sound like you have a lot these days. No, no. So we'll stick to building cases okay. <laughs> and tour buses. Yeah, well, I, I like where you're going with that. And I've had some bands mention to me who I've interviewed saying that these streaming services like Spotify, iTunes, Amazon Music. They prefer to have one single a month rather than just come out with an album, go on tour, live life a little bit, and then come out with a new album. So are you finding that uh, your record label wants the same, or these streaming services want the same thing with your band? Like, would you, they, or would they c come out with an album, go on tour for a while, or do they like you to release, you know, like Cage, Lifeline, Burnout, you know, every couple months? I think the way, the, the environment of the online streaming world is very against a full album nowadays it's very much so like if you put out a full album you're kind of wasting it because it only lets you promote one song every four to six weeks yeah. so if you drop an entire album well 
now you can only choose like one song from that album on whatever platform distribution you're going for. It's very hard to promote a full album mm -hmm. with the modern layout, but yeah. uh, it's not something that we're against doing ever. And I think our well, let me tell you, Rick. EP that's coming out. I I really don't care <laughs> what Spotify what they want. I don't care. Okay. Oh, yes. <laughs> like, I don't care. He's in because, his. He's in his. Let me tell you. Rock and roll <laughs> rebel. <laughs> he's yeah, just like, up. like obviously we have to play the game, but uh, like every month that's unrealistic. I know. Especially if you're if you're touring and doing this. If you're just sitting at home, write music, and that's all you do. Sure. But when it comes to a touring band, no way in hell. You know, three months every three months, absolutely, and yeah. that's difficult depending on your schedule. Yeah. But who who, who am I ca catering to by doing that? An exactly. algorithm. I, I agree. Why do I care? I don't. I don't. Like people who like me on Spotify, that they're already following me. Exactly. So why do I care? They're going to get my music. <laughs> you know, I need to go out there and make new fans and work on my advertising so then they can follow me on Spotify, which then they will get the music whenever I damn well please to give it to them. He's very <laughs> passionate Frank about this spoken. subject if you didn't realize. My God. No, I'm, I'm with you. It's not, I hate it, man. Like, I do what I, I have to do, but damn it. <laughs> I know I'm, I'm with you a thousand percent. And the person that I was speaking to was Andrew Hagar, Sammy Hagar's son. And he said, he goes, I'd rather just release a full album, go on tour, live life a little bit, gain new experiences that will help with my songwriting instead of trying to come up with another song every month. Or so. He goes, I just, yeah. so he said exactly what yeah. you said. And there's other mm -hmm. musicians I spoke with too. And you're basically making three four cents in each song anyway so it's not like you're going to be yeah. making a living yeah. off of that you're making a living touring selling the merchandise doing yeah. other things so i know a lot of people uh you don't even you two don't even or the whole band doesn't have time for this but i know a lot of people when they're trying to make it in the music business they have to do two or three different bands because you're it's hard to make enough money to support themselves with just one band mm -hmm. how do you find it that you can just make a living with the amas it's just well, you know, it's about creating sustainability in the band. We're not going to do anything that we can't continually do. Yeah. So, you know, and, and, and that took a while because the beginning tours, you know, we, we obviously didn't make any money. Mm -hmm. So we had to try to figure out how we can make it sustainable, cut down on costs. How can we not get hotel rooms? How can we just live in the van? How are we going to eat on the road? And it's doing that. Yeah. Is, and kind of figuring it out, that's how we're able to fully sustain ourselves. The band itself doesn't pay, or we don't pay for anything that the band needs. The band pays for it. Mm -hmm. The band takes care of us while we're out on the road. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's, it's about figuring that, that business aspect out to do it. Yeah. And it took a lot of startup money. It took a lot to do it. But, you know, that's, that's what we're working towards. So it can just be self-sustaining and now we're good. Exactly. That's why I can. That's why Crystal doesn't need to have a job, or I was able to quit or step away from it because I. I guess we don't need it. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. You know. I, I love that because you know you you do the bare minimum and you could do it if you want to. Most. I mean, not saying most people. Some people who don't want it bad enough are like, oh, I can't live like this. It's like obviously you don't mm -hmm. want it bad enough. So I completely understand that. And I said I have friends who've done that, and you got to get get in the van. You got to read that book or even listen to it. The audio get in the van. That and is like, your life. Yes. yes. That, that is your life. Yeah. I was saying everybody, you know, everybody's life is different. So there are certain things that work for other people. Yeah. You know, some people have a really cozy job, but they can spare the money and do some bigger tours and, and, and do, you know, use their RV and go and do that. And, yeah. they, you know, but they don't rely on the band. So that's fine too. Yeah. It just depends what you're in it for, you know? So there's no right or wrong way. This exactly. is just how we do it, you know? Yep, and yeah. it's and even you. with that, you know, touring is not for everybody. No. There's a lot of a lot of sacrificing that goes into doing, especially on the scale that we're doing as, you know, mm -hmm. as a band. So it's like you have to know, you know, what extent are you going to be in it for? Mm -hmm. You yep. know, it's like if you can do it for every little bit here and there. But, you know, we're we're trying to make a full living just off of this. So we're like, OK, this is going to take way more sacrifice than we ever thought being mm -hmm. 13 trying to learn how to play guitar or you yeah. know me being thrown into it i did not see this yeah. coming i thought someone was just gonna find me and oh i'm gonna become famous yeah. oh no, no oh no that's yeah. how none of that none of 
None yeah. of it. <laughs> that's, that's why I think that these these shows like The Voice and American, they're they're the people that get that they're missing so much. Because I think there's so much more into what you're doing, and living life, going on the road, you know, being the ten year overnight success instead of just getting on stage and then they they start playing all these different places. They really have no idea what they're doing because they didn't experience everything that your experiences. So personally. Right. I think I would have more fun, even though there's a lot more to, it, to do it the way you're doing it. And you get a more, lot more out of it than just say, all right, I played on a TV show for two weeks. I'm a star. There, you know, you're not. Yeah. 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 There's more of a story. Yeah. Yeah. And it's all yeah. about the story. My, my mom's an author. So I always look at it. I was like, well, this is going to be one hell of a book. <laughs> so <Yep>. oh, yeah. <laughs> <What>? People <laughs> are going to really like this read. <laughs> I'm hoping she's going to be writing a biography on the Almas because I, I will definitely, already, I'm going to pre-purchase it now. I want a signed copy. <laughs> well, good. I'll let her know. We have a buyer. <laughs> well, another thing that makes a band, I mean, you have to be a talented musician to, to make it, but also marketing. And that's a completely different animal. I want to talk about that because you guys are great at marketing. I want to talk about the campaign that you had for the release of Almas 2. You raised money for a radio campaign that got all the fans involved. This will help promote smaller radio stations and shows like the Claus Corner. So uh, first of all, how did that get started? And uh, what did the fans get for donating? Uh, so we released 100 uh, EPs. Um, pre-released. Pre, Pre-released 100 EPs. And they they got a, a special design cover and everything that you we will never print like that ever again. So it's a one of a kind uh, CD and they got a special poster that has a, a special thank you letter on the back uh, that we will never release. <laughs> um, it, it, it's just, it's our way of showing appreciation because the only reason we were able to do our radio campaign at the time is because the fans bought the EP and raised the money. I don't, well, you know, it. I suppose I could take out a loan and, and do the radio campaigns and do this and do that and, but I don't know. I th I feel it's more legitimate when the fans do it. Yeah. When they're the reasons we made it or the reason the song is being played on the radio. Um, I want it to be because of them, not just because I had a bunch of money. Yeah. No, and I love you that know? because not, not only do I love how appreciative the Almas are for their fans, but also the fact when you get the fans involved, they feel like they're a part of it. And that makes it even more of a personal thing for them. Cause they're like, Oh yeah, I helped get this. And I helped with this song. My name's on this. I got this. Mm -hmm. And the, it gives you that, that personal connection with the band and the fans. I love that. That's like, that was that your idea, Frank? Uh, yeah. Well, you have a lot of good ideas. <laughs> He's well, the brain. He's uh, the brain. Uh, <laughs> Or a great comments like Wonder Twin Powers activate. Got the yeah. touring, <laughs> got the concept. <laughs> mm, let's do it. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about some of some of the things you've done. Like I mentioned in the intro, 2023, the Josie Music Awards at the Grand Old Opry, Hard Rock Band of the Year. Congratulations on that. Thank, Thank you. you. And so yeah. who who were you up against? What were some of the bands that you uh, were up against? Good question. That is, it's honestly a blur still. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that we even, you know, our nomination you know, happened and then we ended up taking home the, the award. We were kind of just sitting there like, oh, well, then it's popcorn's really good. And this is a really cool experience. This is my first time in the Grand Ole Opry. Wow. You know, he, Frank uh, actually never really knew the significance of the Grand Ole Opry until showing up that day. Yeah. And next thing we know, we're standing in the circle, the famous circle. And we're like, this is surreal you know, because yeah. we, we were just there for the experience of like, this is really cool. You know, we're in the middle of a tour and, you know, we kind of took a, a small little break to do the, the award show. And we're sitting there in this famous building watching musicians from around the world be, you know, showcased in this event and it was a really cool time yeah like i said i i don't even know who we were up against it was so i don't know i just didn't realize the significance of this whole thing yeah you know so like at the time, at the the time, time. like you know i'm just dressed in my rock clothes man and i'm like <laughs> he was know? only dressed in his yeah clothes. i was like whatever <laughs> yeah and there's a red carpet they're taking pictures all this stuff and i'm like wait a second 
And, you know, everyone's reading off these speeches when they re receive their awards. I'm like, oh, they must already know that they won. Yeah, they were already given like, They were tipped off. Yeah, Little like, oh. Uh, we know that the paper that they were holding was the one they give you to trade in for the actual award. Yeah. And so we're like, oh, well, see, they're all holding paper. We don't have paper. We didn't win. And yeah. then our name gets called. Our hearts drop. And, and I'm like, everyone around us that came out was so excited going, woo! And we're just like, oh, no. And I'm like, I have to say something thing man like i gotta talk in front of a thousand people now <laughs> like, oh um yeah so <laughs> yeah i i love it it's almost similar to a crystal speaking with uh jakey lee for 20 minutes not even really it was it's like you go into grand old opera you're like hey this is a great place what, what are they yes. concerts here <laughs> yeah what are people doing here yeah. And of course, that was my first time wearing heels since I broke my leg earlier that summer. Oh, and so I was like, wait, no, now I have to go upstairs in this dress wearing heels. I'm like, I'm going to fall on my face in front of everybody. It's going to be a terrible mm -hmm. time. <laughs> uh, I didn't, good. though. Well, I, didn't. Oh, I'm You're so good. thankful. <laughs> well, I'm glad I'm glad you survived. <laughs> After everything else that we talked about that you survived, I think I'm, I think that's just another stepping stone for you. Just <laughs> with all the cold <laughs> video shoots, the extreme heat, breaking your leg. Right. You didn't. Know. I always uh, I always mention this to people. And I want your opinion, both of your opinions on this, because I say there's a huge difference between. I mean, some people have both qualities: being the best musician in the room and also the greatest performer. So, do you have? And I know I don't mean to put you on the spot, but. If, can you think of like a couple of your favorites of both, like favorite musician versus favorite performer? Oh, oh man. You know, well, the crew and a light divided, I have to say they're some of the most chaotic performers, uh, hey, to say the least. Yo. Uh, their guitarist, Scott, uh, hangs from the rafters playing guitar. Love it. Um, That's crazy. Like every once in a while, uh, between him uh, and their other guitarist, Doug. Doug, he'll like sit on his shoulders and they'll both be playing guitar. And JC moves all over the stage. Yeah. She owns the place. And going on tour with them was just yeah. fun watching their them every night. Yeah, their performance is phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. yeah as for. As for like, oh, see. players. See, oh man, like, see, I like John Five as a player. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like, yeah, like he's a great player. Yeah. You know, his performance. I, I don't. I don't know. I just like his playing. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> to be but, honest, we look yeah. at everybody. We're just like, wow, everyone's so good at you know playing the instrument. We're up there just having fun. We're like, oh, I don't even know if we're great at it. No, no, but. But we have that's, fun. That's what I love about that because I always say, I, if I really want to listen to the song exactly how it's supposed to sound, I can go home and listen to the CD or stream it. I'd sure. when I'm at a concert, I want to see a show. I want to have some fun. I want to get the, the. I'd rather have the band mess up a little bit, and it's just it shows that they're human and they're having fun instead of like being so technically correct. That I remember I saw Robert Fripp from King Crimson. And a yes. small club in Connecticut called Toes Place. I'm not sure if you ever played there. I don't know if you ever come mm -hmm. to Connecticut. It's a club where I mean, everybody played there. Springsteen when he was coming up, Rolling Stones. I mean, a lot, it's a very famous club. But the, um, Robert Fripp played there, and the, the bouncers were saying, nobody could talk. I said, it's a bar. And he goes, I know it's the stupidest thing. But he was so worried that people were like, if they're, they're going to mess him up. So, I mean, it's just, it really wasn't even a fun experience seeing the show. Oh, it was oh my goodness. It was great. But it was like being in school saying, shh. Yeah, I oh so gosh. weird. That's the... It's like I went to a rock concert, not a library. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That's, that, yeah. I think they made a comment like that. But it's just, so that's why I think, like, I'd rather have, see the musician up there having some sight. And I love the fact, I mean, I've, see, I've seen clips of you guys. You guys are great live, and you put on a great show. So it's just, uh, I, are you going to be coming around to the Northeast sometime? I live in Connecticut. Any time, like Massachusetts, okay. Rhode Island, well, New York? Well, we are currently booking um, a tour in September that's going to lead us up the East Coast. So we'll see if we can get close enough. Yes, I want to go to Maine. So yeah. we have to go past Connecticut to get to yeah. Maine. So well, I was going to be a really long tour. I will, yeah, I will like... drive to Maine to see you guys. Oh, okay, okay, see? Okay. We'll see if gonna... we find to Maine. We might as well go to Connecticut. That's what I'm saying. So... We're gonna go... Yeah, we're going to do both. Check yeah, out. So we have Check to plan that out. But cur yeah, but currently, uh, nothing right now. Uh, but Nothing officially. Nothing officially, but we are working on September. 
All right. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I have the booker on the show. <laughs> yeah, see, that's <laughs> the touring. What's your opinion on this? I've, I spoke with different musicians and I get different answers. Uh, having the teleprompter on stage, what's your opinion on that? I've only played with one band that the vocalist had a teleprompter on stage. Um, I have stage fright. And so that would be a great tool for me. Yeah. But yeah. I'm so self-conscious if anybody ever would have like would know that I was using a teleprompter. Yeah. I would be so ashamed of it. Yeah. So, I mean, to each their own, but I couldn't. I don't know. I don't really care. Yeah. Like if, if you if you blank out because like, oh, man, I got distracted or. I don't know. Like I, you know, I, I forget some guitar parts, you know, randomly, yeah. you know, it just happens. I'm like, oh, I just blank out. Oh, with a singer, it's like, at least you can look down and go, Oh, Oh yeah. That's the, yeah. there it is. And just, you know, I, I don't see a problem with that. There, yeah. It's yeah. not like you don't have memory. You, yeah. can't, you know, I, it's sort of like a backup just in case. Yeah. You yeah. Know? And no, I have shame. No... no shame on other people. Just me. I couldn't do it. No, yeah. no. I'm also super blind. So I'd need contacts because I, I had been too much. My glasses will fall off and I'm not going to be able to read it. So. Well, it's funny because I was in metal bands, as I mentioned. So every time I would forget a lyric, I would just jump into the audience, do a stage dive. Nobody even knew what was going on. So. <laughs> that I got the it. crowd That's going, awesome. then I would get back up the stage to remember the lyrics again and start back. So, but yeah. I'm, 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 I always I'm... joke with people that if I forget lyrics, I'll make stuff up on the spot. Yeah. No one will ever criticize me because it's my original song. You exactly. don't really know the lyrics <laughs> as well as I do. You probably might know. So, there are some people that know the lyrics better than me yeah. uh, for our own music. And one person has been like, so you uh, changed the lyrics there yeah. for that song. And be like, you you heard nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's when you take the, the mic and just put it in the audience. We're doing the audience participation part. <laughs> yeah, be like, you sing it now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, so I want to talk about this because I love what you said about this, Frank. You said the existence of this band has always been about helping each other, whether it's through inspiration, a positive message, or simply creating a fun, entertaining environment where people can get away from life's problems. So that being said, I want to talk about Rock to Stop 22. Ah, uh, yes, sir. I love that. Uh, that. That is one of our most favorite events that we play every year. It's to raise awareness about the suicide in our returning home veterans, which was something that we never, I, I never considered uh, up until that event. And, you know, uh, on average, 22 veterans a day commit suicide. And so, you know, if, if we as a band doing what we love can also help people, well, it's just a win-win. It's a bonus. It's a bonus, you know. Um, yeah, so we, we love that event. Everybody, we've grown uh, uh, to become really good friends with all the people that put that event on. And, yeah, I just absolutely love it. When and where is it? Uh, it happens every year, second week of August. Yep, in Broadhead, Wisconsin at uh, Camp Minnehaha on Sweet Minnehaha River. Yep. Yeah, so basically you can go tubing down the river, you get in a floaty, and you spend four hours going down the river. And then, oh. uh, you, yeah, it's so good. You just chill, and then all of a sudden you pop up by the campground, you go take a shower, then it's a rock show. I mean, no, come it's, on. it's cool. It's an all day event. There's camping, there's, you know, a fire where everybody's telling stories. Yeah, it's and two nights, it's, two days. Yep. Two days. Yep. And then, yeah, Friday and Saturday. Uh, and then Sunday we go tubing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Man, I would, I, you know what? I might have to take a couple of days off and go down there. That sounds like a good you time. Should. It's, you so, should. It's, it's just a fun time. Everyone's really nice. It's a good time. Well, another thing I've done was comedy and I found out I used to put on my own shows and the most fun I ever had was putting on shows that were benefits and one was for the veterans another one was for uh, relay for life with fighting cancer and I always found those were the most fun shows because everybody was there for and they loved the cause and they were there to have a good time so they knew what was to expect and they just everybody was in such a great mood everybody was having fun there was no uh, there was no drama there was no uh, you know people just being bored so I, I when events like that it's just, I've never been to a bad event where people where it's like, this is boring. You know, it's always a, it's always a fun time and always everybody's in a great mood and they're there for a great reason. So I, I love the fact mm -hmm. that you're doing that. I love the fact you looked out, look, like you mentioned, because at, at the end of your website, I think the thing says, we are here. I love this. I had to write it down. Um, the Elmas exist for its fans because of its fans. And I love the fact yes. that like, you're so appreciative of the, your fans. You're, you love helping different organizations. It's just, it's a, a positive experience all around. Yeah, that's I mean, we try to because we only 
we can only go as far as the audience will take us. So yeah. if people enjoy what we're doing enough, then they're the reason that we get any further than mm -hmm. we are right now. All right. So I want to talk about the current status of the band. Has there been any changes recently? Yes, uh, yes there has been. Our a drummer of four years, Andrew, uh, decided to step away from the band and, uh, you know, go go work on other things, different projects. And, uh, yeah, the, that, that's the biggest change. Yeah. Yeah. Ben. Do yeah. you have anybody else that in mind to take over? Yes, yes. we do. Mm -hmm. um, we have solidified a drummer for our upcoming tours. Um, and basically, he kind of gave us a green light. Or I should say me a green light to just keep booking and he'd be there for it. Yep. And right. uh, Vinny. Yep. Our buddy Vinny. Our buddy Vinny. Yeah. Uh, we met him uh, years ago on a tour and um, we actually knew of Andrew's departure for, for almost two months now. Okay. Yeah. So we, we've known for some time that he was going to step away. So we've had ample time to try to find somebody, get them up to speed. Um, so we don't have to cancel any tours or anything like that. So yeah, yeah but we're, Oh, good. Well, I'm happy to hear that. I don't mean to interrupt you. No, 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 no. It's all good. We're looking forward to touring with Vinny. Um, I said we, we've been friends for a while, and yeah, he, he's a he's a real fun guy, so I'm sure he's going to blend in real well with the band. <laughs> yeah. Well, the question for you is, uh, if Andrew decides to come back, well, are you going to take him back, or is Vinny the new permanent member? Uh, uh, we don't have a permanent member, um, okay. and we're not sure what the future holds. So yeah. okay. we really don't have a, an actual answer for that. But we're, I think kind of like our studio time, we're pretty go with the flow in the moment, and yep. we'll see what comes of it. The only thing I can control and do is in the now. So that's all I right worry Right now about. we got to build a new vehicle. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'd like to say, when have you ever done something like this in the past? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> like when you had to write a new song right in the spot when you had to do this can you yeah. be here tomorrow yeah we could be there tomorrow so yeah I no think. absolutely i mean yeah that's always how this band's been I mean, like when our singer my old singer left you yeah. know crystal hopped in and, and we, we i think only canceled three shows or something yeah. and we were right back at it i mean the band has always moved forward through it you know members changing this that we've never skipped a beat so yeah, this is this is no different. Yeah, I think the band was only down um, a month without a singer. So uh, they left in September. I came in in October. And then we by 2018, we were already out performing with a full new album. And then yeah. we released it a couple months after that. Yeah. So just always always have to keep moving forward. You always have to have a plan um, because, you know, it's not just one one person's life you know you got to take care of you got all the rest of the people in the band you know all the rest of the members so we have to keep things going because this is our life we can't stop you know we, we have to push forward so yeah so we always have to have a plan to move forward so all right well what's next and where can people find you well what's next is touring touring and touring recording um, and recording and touring and touring um, and more obnoxious music videos, more than likely. Probably. <laughs> more yeah. more no, fun, I mean, <laughs> freezing, extreme heat. Yeah. I think like, the next one we're planning is going to be a lot more low key than what we've been putting out. Just kind of like coming back to our roots. Yeah. Um, probably going to film it on the cruise that we're going on. Oh, yeah, wait, let's talk so. about that. I'm glad. No, I'm, let's stop right there for a second. I almost forgot about the sure. cruise. Did you, uh, did, did you already do the cruise? No. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. September. Uh, in September. September. Uh, that's why we're that's another tour we're going on based around one event that we're doing so we've got a cruise uh the 9th through the 13th i believe of september don't quote me on it but i know it starts the 9th um it's right out of miami and we're going to like the bahamas and uh, yeah. i can't remember where else exactly yeah. but it's yeah. it's basically just a a cool experience for us because we've never performed on a cruise before uh, i believe frank and josh have never been on a cruise they never been on at the best so, time. so it's oh, gonna be interesting so, and and so you can still get tickets for this cruise too you can get rooms it's a super good deal uh like i think it's four nights uh three of the nights you have rock music bands um it's a good time and it's one of those things where you can book your room now and you can pay later yeah they've so, got a really cool deal going on right now yes. so you can just reserve your spot and deal with the finances afterwards yes so well i will make sure that as we're talking 
that's on the screen so people who want to be on the cruise i can tell you last year i went to bermuda i had the best time it was the first cruise i've ever been on but i love it oh, every nice. band that was there they're like can you come to every show they actually named the band seaside duo with sir richard they love me because i was always the oh. one getting into it it was, it was so much fun <laughs> because every they would have that's like different awesome. nights like different like theme nights one would be like uh, i'm trying to think carpenters another one would be uh like i'm just thinking of different bands but they would do different sets I yeah think the beatles and i had loved it and a lot of times they'll this wasn't like that um this was just a regular cruise with different same three bands they play different sets for this cruise is it more of a theme night like you know they have 70s nights rock nights so is there um, a theme to this to this cruise I don't believe there's no. a theme to this one. I think it's just uh, an eclectic group of people. They're probably going to have like a tribute night one of the nights because yeah. there are two um, two confirmed tribute bands. Yeah. There's a Motley Crew and a Poison tribute band. But we've got bands like Scotty Austin, yeah, Paralandra. Paralandra. We got um, a Shallow Side. The Lonely Ones, formerly Bobo Flax. Oh, I, inter I interviewed them. They're a really good band. Yep. Yeah, yes. they're cool dudes. Yeah, so uh, the other L.A., yeah um so yeah there's just a bunch of just a bunch of good rock bands on this thing you know so there's no theme just rock and roll all right yeah, i guess it's a great thing. time yeah i guess rock is a thing but... <laughs> <laughs> well i should say i had the most fun interviewing you two i loved it before we oh. go though is there anything that i missed that you want to go over um i think just summing it up is if anybody's interested in checking us out we will be in a city near you uh in the coming months yep. but uh find us at almas the band.com a-l-m-a-s the band.com and if you are on any social media we are at almas the band as well mm -hmm. so one thing to remember and that's it <laughs> yep. and remember when you're watching those videos everything they went through to put those videos out so enjoy it <laughs> Yes. yes like please. subscribe and comment because the algorithm loves it even though i hate it yep. and, <laughs> and who really cares what spotify has to say release yeah. the songs when you feel like it damn straight, damn straight. <laughs> frank crystal i had the best time please you got to come back on the show again i would love to have you back here we could talk about you know maybe future band members coming on or, or talk about um you know tour talk about anything a new releases whenever, whatever you want to talk about you you two have carte blanche come on the show just to say hi awesome, awesome. Well, we'll definitely have to talk about the uk when we get yes. back yes yes absolutely definitely when you get back from you that's what we'll do when you get back from the uk we'll talk about that so i definitely want to hear all your experiences because i've never heard one band have a bad experience it's always been very positive and the fans are so appreciative of just having music there so i'm looking forward to hearing all about it yeah. Oh, you make us so excited yeah. for that. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, anyway, well, once again, it was great having you, and I will definitely be talking to you soon. That wraps up the latest episode of The Claws Corner. A huge thanks goes out to founding member and lead guitarist Frank Slifka and lead vocalist Crystal Teglin of The Almost for taking time out of their extremely busy schedule to be a guest on my show. I also need to thank editor extraordinaire John Bristol, the award-winning Elmwood Productions, for always doing a superb job editing the show each and every week and making it available to all on YouTube. I am also extremely grateful to Joseph Timothy Quirk and Rob Bull for all they do to make my show available on several connected radio stations as well as Spotify, iTunes, Amazon Music, Audible, and iHeartRadio. Thank you all very, very much. And lastly, but definitely not least, I need to thank you, the viewer, for always tuning in. Enjoy your day, everyone. I hear bim, bim. <laughs> what's a diaphragm again? <laughs> yeah. 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 Ha! We caught one. They're supposed to be weird. Oh yeah, no. If you say so. I've always wanted to be in a movie. Around, around.